What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hatnas, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Marcus Crow, and we speak about the question whether facilitation could be a bachelor's degree. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, scroll down to the show notes to download my free one-page summary. And now, lean back to be inspired. Hello, Marcus. Welcome back. It is lovely to be back, Miriam. Thank you for having me back. It's always a bit of feedback to a house guest if they get invited to to come back a second time. So, you know, that's good. Yes. And funny enough, it was, I think, at the end of our last episode, which is maybe two years ago, that we said, oh, what would it be if there was a bachelor facilitation? Or oh, let's let's record another episode about that. And now here we are. We did threaten that. So um, well, good on us, right, for following through. <laughs> yes. And just as a reminder for those who might have not heard the first episode, mm. just a recap. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? And actually, do you? Well, and, uh, you know, I'm going to, well, it'll, it may, it'll land differently on different people, but I can tell you precisely on the 25th of May, 1997, that was the day that I ran my first workshop. And the way I started, and like, like everybody, well, not everybody maybe, but like lots of colleagues in our field, you know, I fell into it. It was a happy accident. You know, I was a kid who didn't mind presenting and my I asked my sisters at dinner one night, I said, how do I get paid to talk? I'm only 25, you know, because one of them, my elder sister said, look, could you just shut up or at least find a job doing it? And then my my second sister, she said, oh, you could do training courses. I went to one this week and um, the person running that course, he was getting paid to talk and he wasn't an Olympic swimmer or a mountain climber or hadn't swum the English Channel or done anything in particular, but was, you know, running a training course and talking. So I fell into it uh, at a company that's no longer around, a company called Rogen. And uh, and they said, would you like to facilitate our presentation skills programs? And I was thrilled to get that invitation. And looking back on it now, I think I was quite a cheap resource for them. And so they were like, oh, this kid's young and I was 25 at the time, won't cost us much and seems to have the wherewithal they made me prove myself and get on my feet and demonstrate and and then they let me on the 25th of may have my own group of participants to look after so that was the day which is now actually i should have paid more attention to the 25th of may this year because that was the 25th anniversary of, wow. of that beginning yeah i should have been i should have been a linkedin post celebrating a quarter of a century or something but no <laughs> <laughs> it actually just rolled by without me even noticing Wonderful. Isn't it beautiful that you can precisely pinpoint the date? Well, what's lovely about it is with our very disciplined at videoing everybody doing it so that you could watch it back and get feedback. And so I've actually got a, a you know, an old VHS cassette recording of um, my hideous 1990s tie and pastel colored shirt, but actually can see myself, you know, running through the workshop in those very early days. So I'm quite grateful for that. So what has changed in a quarter of a decade in terms of the facilitation craft, if any? Well, so I'm glad. So in adding that last bit, it sort of changes the answer. I think one of the things I think that's changed is the market has been flooded with practitioners. Now you can decide if that's good or bad, and maybe that sort of steers us into our discussion on this podcast. But certainly in the field, there are, I think it was a real boutique thing to do. I'm not even sure people thought it was a job. Mm -hmm. You know, and I I mean, I still, I used to struggle to explain because people would say, what do you do? What? So do you do media? Do you do PR? Um, they didn't, you know, they couldn't understand that there was a job in standing up in front of groups of people inside organizations. I think in the, in what's changed in the craft is in some ways, Not much. Uh, you know, if you take a purist view of going, we're connecting with a group of people and, you know, despite all of the technology and the 
and the development in all of those areas. And, and yes, we're using that in our workshops and we've got our smartphone audience response systems and they're answering questions and upvoting and downvoting and giving feedback and scanning QR codes. And I think all of that, if you take all of that, that's really just some changes to some of the clerical aspects of running workshops. But in the end, I think we're still very similar in that it's a room of people collectively trying to navigate, examine their differences and progress their way towards well, what they felt was the outcome or the, the, the thing they needed to get t- towards together. And I think a lot of that hasn't changed. I think facilitators need to be more dexterous maybe around some of the sensitivities that come up in groups now. You know, certainly mm. something I, I work, I'm in Australia and, you know, we've certainly taken on the idea of an acknowledgement to country, which is to spend time at the front of a workshop to pay deliberate attention to the Indigenous land upon which the workshop is situated. Now, that didn't happen at all in the first, certainly 15 years of my practice and maybe even, you know, 20. Um, But gradually, increasingly, you know, that's an example of something that Mm. um, has has crept into the the field. Yeah, which then also reminds me of the entire diversity issue that now having more online workshops uh, or online sessions that include participants from all around the globe, that we are also maybe more sensitive in including different participant types, different personalities, different cultures. Yes. Yeah, definitely. That's definitely a, a, and in some ways, maybe facilitators got a head start because I think by the very nature of the occupation, I think our field had to work on that I don't know, earlier than it became Mm. as mainstream as it is today. You know, the idea of including everybody in the group, are we hearing from all the voices, Uh, are all the ideas being collected and gathered? And part of our talents among the many, I think, if we do this well, you know, to think of elicitation techniques that draw different temperaments into the dialogue or into the discussion or, you know, gather their ideas and get them onto the table as part of it. So perhaps some of that's just been formalised or made a bit more overt and deliberate. Yeah. Yeah. Which kind of already brings us straight to the topic of is there is there space or does it make sense to have something like a bachelor degree in facilitation? Is there yeah. enough meat around? Is it structured and formal enough? And I think one nuance or maybe a first step into this conversation is also to what degree does a certification of facilitation actually adds value, make sense? What is the meaning of it? And yeah, let's start maybe with a personal reflection. Did you get a certification facilitation at some point? And looking back at your very first session you facilitated 25 years ago, do you believe that some sort of formal or informal education would have helped you or prepared you? Well, the, the the answer to the first part of the question is absolutely no, not anything. Well, sorry, that's not true. N- nothing formal and, mm-hmm. and never went and got a certification of facilitation. Now, over the years, like many of us, I was certified by private companies who owned a particular piece of intellectual property where they would, um, and actually it was a big part of their own revenue stream, was to charge would-be facilitators of their instrument mm-hmm. a fee for the right to distribute it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, which you th- if you think about that in classic channel retail terms, it's a, it's a manufacturer engaging with a wholesaler and saying to the wholesaler, pay me some money to earn the right to then on-sell my tool. Yeah. Um, and certainly over the years of my career, I've... Um, done a couple of those uh, because they're fashionable tools or things that our clients were using a lot. And so it sort of had a commercial imperative to say, well, go and get qualified in that so you can run this thing. But actually the way I was trained was I was given a leader's guide of a presentation skills workshop. And then the first thing I did, which I think this gets to you know, part of the discussion is to what extent is our field like theoretical physics and for which there is a body of robust, durable knowledge we can be taught in the abstract in a classroom environment, say, to go out there and 
deploy. And if you read the skill acquisition literature, which is where our firm's name comes from in the 10,000 hours, you know, it talks about some things are things that we understand first in order to do them. And other things have a quality where you must do them first in order to understand them. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so, for example, you might say, well, mathematics, you can understand it. And then so you can go and do it. Whereas water skiing or tennis, you might say, there's no point being lectured on water skiing. You need to get in the water behind the boat, grab the handle and try and stand up. And fall down. And fall down and be picked up and go again. And and so I think facilitation has elements of both of those where they said, look, we don't want you to fall down in front of our clients. So let's get you to rehearse and practice and you can fall down in front of us. And so I would demo some of the parts of the content. Um, Then I co-facilitated. And then there was a day where they said, okay, we think you're ready. You can go and run a workshop on your own with a group and we won't watch you. Mm -hmm. We'll video it because we'll use it to coach you afterwards, but we'll let you go. And, you know, I was incredibly nervous, you know, the nights before, as, as and I still get nervous before things. I still get a bit anxious about, oh, have I done enough? Have I prepared enough, asked enough questions, got enough context around what I'm doing? Do I, am I doing the thing that's probably going to work? And if it doesn't, have I got the backup plans ready? I still feel that today. But definitely, I think if I'd had some of the education around group dynamics and group process, I think that would have helped me maybe not at the very beginning because I probably wouldn't have been sophisticated enough to do anything with it that was useful. But Mm. later on, I think it would have been useful to have a protocol that said, all right, it's time for you now to learn this body of theory as you pay attention to your work. Whereas I was really just, again, like many of us, I imagine, just doing workshops and hopefully getting a little bit better as they went along. But there was no structured reflection process of any great note. I mean, yes, we chatted to each other in the kitchen about, oh, how'd you go last week? And But, you know, there was no sort of deliberate mechanism. I think, and again, we'll touch on, I think psychotherapy is a good model for our field in terms of how do you help practitioners who work with groups of people on their own find a way to professionally develop. Mm. build their build their skills yeah thank you for walking us through that and i what i found interesting is the distinction between learning a tool so getting certified to use a specific tool or technique a company has ip on which is very different from the craft of facilitation that you actually need in any circumstance when you're confronted with a group, which has more to do with this, as you mentioned, the group dynamics, the how do you stand there knowing that you've never prepared enough? Because as a matter of fact, you cannot prepare every situation, every group is different, every circumstance is different. So at some point, you just need to trust your gut and your experience that Mm. it will work out. And that you can be there in service of the group and help them to create that magic. Yes. Yeah. And while listening to you, I, the notion of maturity came to my mind. Of mm. To have this, yes, we can read about group dynamics. And I think we all do. There's so many books about facilitation and the theory behind it. And as you say, if we learn it too early, there's not much we can do with it because there's the entire notion of the inner game, I think, Mm. of how do we avoid getting triggered by a group or by specific participants? Mm. Is this something that you can learn in a classroom? Well, see, that's that's interesting because that points to some of the the theorists like, I mean, if we go back to the, you know, the Connecticut workshop in 1947 where, you know, Kurt Lewin accidentally figured out that the, the, the facilitators were reviewing the group's performance that day um, and it was now, let's call it in the evening, you know, so let's, let's say it was half past six in the evening and the facilitators were reviewing how the group had gone and the group were walking back from dinner or drinks and saw the facilitators discussing them and asked if they could join and be part of the discussion. And then roughly put, 
they the participants came in in the evening and joined the facilitators, but discussing the group. And that was sort of the origins, or it's considered one of the one of the original, you know, I'm always interested in intellectual patient zero. Where did something start? Mm-hmm. It's quite hard to pin that down in different things. But I think in groups you can give Kurt Lewin in 1947 a tick for going. That was one of the first moments where the idea that a group can talk about itself while it is itself a group, otherwise known as what, you know, Kansas Leadership Center calls case in point and Heifetz and Linsky talk about that as part of how they do their teaching. So, you know, you can learn about group dynamics theory in a discussion, like it's a lecture, but then you can also talk about how it's playing out. You can talk about Beyond's assumptions, you know, there's 1961. So then you, you that's sort of, you know, an English influence from Beyond and the Northfield experiments where you go, okay, can we see Beyond's basic assumptions playing out here in this group now? And so in addition to getting the theory, you're also getting effectively the practical at the same time by feeling it in the room. Now, you need you need a great facilitator or convener, as they might say, to help the group move between the teacherly moments of theoretical discussion and then the observations of what is actually on display in the group here and now, which is a, a lovely way to learn this craft. Because you're basically applying, so you're constantly in the conversation between the experience and the meta level. Yeah, yeah, something that Chris Moles, um, who was part of the late Ralph Stacey's sort of academic cohort out of University of Hertfordshire, where they talked about involvement and detachment. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you're involved in the group and then you detach for a little bit and go, oh, look what we just did. Yeah, You know, we, we all ganged up on Tom and Mary and criticized them for being responsible for the group's poor performance. And, you know, that's an example of scapegoating, you might say. So that ability to involve and detach, involve and detach, which I think is part of a facilitator's dexterity as well, you know. Yes, precisely. Get caught up in the group and enjoy a joke maybe and laugh with them and share genuinely the humour of the moment and at the same time detach to realise we can't laugh our way home to the workshop. We have to get some work done. I need to call the group to order and send it in the direction perhaps. You know, I think that's a really useful distinction for a for a facilitator. Yeah. And I wonder where then when we think of a bachelor degree, which is an academic degree, mm. which assumes that there is, as you said, a body of theory that is always valid and might be similar to psychotherapy or psychology, where would be the difference and why would you think would this be needed? Yeah, and and I've got to be careful with my answer here because part of it could just be an internal anxiety of my own around being in a field that that doesn't sanction access. There isn't a royal college of facilitation like there is of surgery. You know, there isn't a a, a school of law, well, a school of facilitation, notwithstanding the lovely Kirsty and her business name, but <laughs> but in terms of you know, there's the school of medicine and the school of physics and the, and the faculties, you know, we just don't, we don't have that now. And that might be because we don't need it. And maybe it's my own intellectual insecurity going, yeah, but I wish we did. And I wish we were made to do continuing professional education and be registered and we could be struck off and lose our license, so to speak, in the way that doctors and lawyers and, you know, many professions, that's the point of the profession, which is to guard the body of knowledge and the standards around which it's deployed. So part of it could be my own insecurities about, well, I wish we had one of those so I could be inside those walls. But then possibly, you know, if you hold it as a generous thought to go, no, maybe that would be in service of the field to say, let's set up a, an institution that sanctions access and has requirements and standards and and isn't optional. Like, like I know we've got it in, I mean, the, you know, the IAF have had a go, the coaching federations variously exist, but you know, they're optional. Whereas you, you can't practice medicine if you haven't got your license. Whereas, you know, we know that's not true in our field. You know, you can just go and start facilitating. Yeah. And interesting. So the, I think the main difference is that yes, there's an IAF and yes, they have their, body of 
knowledge that they require certified facilitators to know and to master and they're tested on that and still it's not it's not public knowledge it's not a body of researchers all over the globe that would continuously test these assumptions and theories and apply them to different contexts and for it to be globally valid like in medicine mm. wouldn't this mean that there is something that is always true so our bodies they look a certain way when you cut them open and you better know what awaits you when you start cutting mm. right when you cut a group open to observe their behavior yes depending on what has happened on the context on the cultural context on the personalities um, the composition every time you look at it it's different mm. well and that's the i guess the stability or if you like the volatility of the context so in your medical example the volatility of the context is incredibly low to to zero it doesn't there's no variance mm -hmm. which is why a surgeon i mean it's why we can make a vaccine so we can make a vaccine in one country in the world ship it everywhere else and say well you take it in africa you take it in australia you take it in america and you know without getting caught up in a vaccine discussion but but you know it'll work regardless of context you don't have to have it in the morning you don't have to have it in the evening you don't have to have it with food facing north at sunrise none of that matters just have it and it does its thing and the funny thing is and now that you that i listen to you i actually realized that even for medicine and vaccines it is not true today what what the research is finding is that lots of the medical treatments and even surgery were always tested with men and very rarely with women. They mm. were very, most of the time tested with Caucasian middle-aged men mm. and not with um, African descendants. So is it really true that the vaccine works across every population in the same way? Well, I mean, I'm well. I'm certainly out of my lane to comment on that yeah. specifically, but I suppose as a as an example that's trying to make the general point that medicine is in possession of more cause and effect relationships that are robust and indifferent to context, and even so that is say, difficult to yeah, say. Mm. Right. So you might say, you know, penicillin, or you know, and really, if we think about the hierarchy of the sciences from physics to chemistry to biology yeah. to psychology to sociology, anthropology, and then up into the humanities and the arts, you know, the lower down that stack, the more durable some mm -hmm. of the cause and effect relationships are. And so on that, you know, you know, for example, you know, gravity is 9.8 meters per second per second. And that's true where I live in Sydney and true of where you live in in Holland. You know, we do, it, it's the same. Now, again, it's an example and I'm yeah, not a yeah, physicist. Yeah. But I think your point about in in our field, not only are groups different when you cut them open in different parts of the world, the same group is different this week to next week. Mm -hmm. The context has shifted mm -hmm. by a week, you know, particularly because now they've got the memory of you. So if you facilitated the same group a second and third time, see on the first time, and we'll all have felt this, you've got your favorite moves that you like to do that win the group over. They're icebreakers, they're jokes their opening gambits that you know light the room up and get things going but you can only use them once at the first one and then when you get to the second workshop they already know you've got that and done that so they go okay well what else have you got what's your next set of get us going because we like you and you were great last time but this is the second time so you know off you go um, and so straight away there you go well the context is different now because we've got a history together yeah um, and so i think that's the That's both the fascinating part of our field because you never run the same workshop twice. Yeah. Because again, to that example, at a minimum, it's the group a week later with the history and a memory of you, but that it, it's always unique. Whereas, you know, when you do a, you know, in, in other fields, there's probably more repetition and familiarity to some of what they do where they go, I can reliably deploy the 
playbook that I do in this situation and it will work. Yeah. On the other hand, I was just thinking, as you mentioned, anthropology. Yes, maybe an academic degree in facilitation would have many overlaps or more overlaps with anthropology than we would think. Because basically it's um, the observation of a cultural context of groups in their cultural context without intervening yeah, and drawing conclusions from that. And I think in order to become a better facilitator, to have awareness of such cultural differences and group dynamics and their rituals and their religions and their the way how groups, how cultures stick together, mm. I think there's a would be huge learning for our craft. Couldn't agree more. And I think that that point about you know, if you think about being dropped on a university campus, you might say, God, we need to go all over this place. We need to go over to anthropology and spend some time. We need to go over to sociology and spend some time mm -hmm. and psychology and spend some time. And then you might say, okay, we now need to go off to a comedy club and do an open mic night as a, as a practical exercise, you know, get up there and just take on a room full of people and see how you go. We could probably do some time in the theatre school and Improv uh, theatre, yeah. In, in, and learn there. Um, we could go over to the military and watch and learn from those occupations where they give short, sharp, direct instructions in high-pressure, dangerous mm -hmm. environments and go, how do you do that? We could go over to counterterrorism or first responder and emergency response and go, okay, how do you mobilise when something happens that you weren't expecting to happen? So we could learn from, from them. And I guess this is what's fascinating about this sort of hypothetical question is that On the one hand, it could be like a bachelor's degree with lectures and notes and theories. And on the other hand, it's it's like a trade out of a guild, like like carpentry mm. mm -hmm. uh, or the performing arts, where you say, okay, we're going to get you to go and do some practical things and and then debrief. And so, you know, there's elements of trade school, and then there's elements of of you know the classic tertiary degree lecture hall kind of environments. And I think we'd have an interesting blend of activities and then, you know, shaped over time. So there'd be a, you know, the year one, you know, one, one year you'd do certain things, just learn to be good at stagecraft, learn how to walk into a room, learn how to hold a group, get their attention, get their participation. Yeah. And then as the years went by, you'd add more and more to that in different texture. And I'm now wondering whether graduation would actually be the moment to then unlearn all of what you've learned before. Because basically, when you walk into the room, then suddenly you have to be ready to just stand there and and hold the space and get from your mind into your body to sense what happens in the group. Because I think many of the, I was just thinking of the danger to intellectualize the craft suddenly. I think mm -hmm. it's. Because there's something like compassion, empathy, maybe even charisma, as you just mentioned, how to walk into a room and hold the space and catch attention. You don't want someone to blow a whistle like if they were in the military to catch people's attention. You want someone who walks into the room and invites everyone to join the circle without the whistle. Yes. So there is this embodiment that you have to get to, I think, by unlearning all the theory that you have learned. Because I'm thinking of a coach who, yeah. or even a therapist, first therapy session, you have someone who just graduated from university having their list of questions they're going to ask their client one by one. And the client with each question feels more uncomfortable because it's so scripted. Well, and, and there is the, the the challenge of having the method but not letting the method have, have us. Mm. And that's what's tricky about apprentice learning because, you know, we do try to codify it and say, you know, here are the 12 questions for which that kind of points to the common factors work of, you know, Bruce Wampold and others who in psychotherapy said, you know what, it actually doesn't seem to be all about the particular technique. You know, is it CBT? Is it 
acceptance commitment therapy? Is it gestalt? Is it, you know, what, what are you particularly doing as opposed to who are you and how is your alliance or therapeutic alliance with the group? Mm. And that's certainly something that struck me over the years as I've gone along in it is I've met people who are wonderful facilitators who I know are brand new to it. They haven't done it. You know, they've come out of a corporate role where they may have done it here and there, but not really. But they just have a lovely, lovely, um, we call it mojo. When we're interviewing for a facilitator in our firm at 10,000 Hours, we ask them to get up and do 20 minutes of something, and we actually don't care what they do. We go, look, engage us. You work with the group, but we don't care what the content is. You pick a piece that goes for 20 minutes. We just want to see if you've got that. And again, that word mojo, it's that sort of look hard to describe. We know it when we see it and, you know, we'll either figure out you kind of got it and then we can teach you content or maybe you don't kind of got it and maybe it's, you know, it's not the right role for you. And I think that's what you're describing is going, it's not just about, oh, I've been trained in the technique. Here Mm. are my questions. I'll ask them each in turn. But to go, I'm here with you. It's almost the Carl Rogers of going, I'm here, present with you, unconditional, positive regard. We're here. I'm holding the space. We're connected. I have some processes that I have planned to use. Maybe I'll use them. Maybe you'll say something next that'll mean that we don't. And that wherewithal to have the frameworks but not let the frameworks have us. Yeah. I like the the example you gave from psychotherapy because that's Basically, it is it's not about the techniques and the methods, but how you respond to them. Well, importantly, the techniques and methods aren't zero in the analysis. Mm -hmm. So they're above zero. Now, the debate is how far above zero, but they're not zero. Uh, And so that's that's an important qualifier so that for and I've seen facilitators who think they can get there just with charm and charisma and engagement. But at some point, you might say, well, okay, we like you. We like being here in the room with you. It feels good. Let's go. Well, then what? So then, you know, maybe then we do say, okay, pick up a post-it note, take out a card, walk over to the wall, get into groups, you know, whatever. We're directing them in some fashion to some productive aim. And so I think, you know, it's on us to have a good And a quiver of arrows, I think, is a nice metaphor. Like you've got a quiver full of ways of engaging the group. Mm. Depending on your read in the room at the time, well, okay, you deploy certain arrows depending on what you think is going to work there and then. Yeah. Which just made me thinking of what are the costs of a failed facilitation job? So what are the costs of a failed workshop, for instance? Because we would need something that is centralized, something that is a label, an educational label or a training. If the risk of damage is high enough. Yeah. Would you have a thought about how you'd measure that or how you'd even define that it had failed to use that word? Yeah. So I've asked over 190 times, maybe <laughs> what makes a workshop fail to my yes, podcast. Yeah. Guest. yeah. And they're all different sorts of answers. What I think, what I also when I just listened to you, is the notion of, yeah, if you just walk into the room with charisma and good attitude, mm. then it becomes about the facilitator, not about the group. It suddenly be, it's not what makes a good facilitator is that they get the best out of the group so that the group finds their answer through the collective wisdom. Mm. If we are not guiding this process, you're basically not getting anything out of the group that you can work with. And then what's the difference between a facilitator and a cult leader? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And I think that the damage is that there is an... um, underestimated damage of a failed workshop or failed facilitation, which means either opening the group to become vulnerable, but not preparing them for the time after the workshop, creating expectations about the outcome that then cannot be used or don't match reality, or even uh, 
pointing out conflict or creating conflict, opening up the space for uh, different opinions to be raised, but then not having the skills to actually make sure that the different parties in the room, in the space, understand each other. Yeah. That there, I mean, again, they're all skills that can be practiced and can be taught. And as you say, be ready for the moment when that last one in particular, right? So you're going, okay, I need to draw out another view. That view is going to be contentious. It's going to collide with the first view. But let me see if I can help the group to depathologize the conflict and see the conflict as just an examination of differences and help the group to, you know, conduct that examination. I think, and it points to the earlier discussion we had, I think the, the challenge we have is that a failed workshop in our trade isn't as bad as a failed surgery in medicine. Um, and I think that's part of why our field isn't heavily governed mm -hmm. because, you know, if we get it wrong, generally speaking, it's not a cataclysmic catastrophe. It's just that we wasted some time, an outcome wasn't reached, you know, people had lunch, people went home, maybe a bit frustrated. Like it's, I'm not saying it's a good thing. It's a, te it's not a good thing, but it's not a calamitous event that is, you know, deeply wounding necessarily. Now saying that, yeah. yes, you know, there could be people who go, I went to this workshop and I've never forgotten it. And it was a, it was an awful experience for all of these reasons, because the wrong things were said in the wrong way at the wrong time. And, and of course, that is a possibility. But I'd argue that probably less likely yeah. in, in our field. I mean, we still absolutely can get it wrong and run a bad workshop. And that's, that's problematic. The topic is so rich. Yes, I, I agree that it's the danger or the risk of traumatizing individuals or groups are maybe yeah. in the outliers. They they exist, they're positive, mm. but not as big as it would call for more regulation in the use of the term or facilitator. Yes. On the other hand, I wonder whether the the skill of facilitation is actually so important in many different fields that it would actually not pay justice to facilitation to have just one bachelor instead of teaching facilitation in other bachelors like a business bachelor. Because if you're in charge of, or even in medicine, then it might not be facilitation more in the coaching area. Mm. But I think it's, it's very similar in many of the tools we're using. Coaching facilitation are similar. And isn't it important to learn these skills in other fields like, like education, like medicine, like business and management on how to deal with group dynamics on how to, how to enable groups and individuals to participate in a conversation and in a collective effort? Yeah, I've often wondered whether, because I, I agree with you, I think that's probably the more likely outcome that that facilitation will never earn its own faculty and have its own body of knowledge and degree, for example, but that it might become its own subject matter area and get formalized in the way that I think presentation skills did. You know, that really didn't exist 30 years ago. You know, the idea that you got trained on how to stand up and present and, you know, 30 years ago it was presenting with overhead transparencies mm -hmm. you remember those that's certainly what i used in the beginnings of my career as, as in well harvard graphics the forerunner to, to powerpoint came along and then we moved over to the computers and the projectors and all of those things and the idea that you you spent time getting trained on it was quite a, a new phenomenon i mean it, it grew out of media training where they said we're going to train you to talk to camera because you get interviewed a lot And then it sort of suddenly blossomed into this idea of actually we'll train our executives to stand up and present their ideas. Um, and now that's considered quite regular and quite unremarkable to do presentation skills training as part of being in an organization. And I think facilitation is probably where presentation skills were in the mid eighties yeah. that it, it's, it's there. There's a core, there's a small core of people who do it. Gradually, all of us are running facilitation skills for managers type workshops inside organizations. And I think it'll be another 10 or 15 years and it will be considered a standard inclusion in regular executive development as part of 
someone's career trajectory in the same way that leadership is and presenting is and you know hopefully up. hopefully and i yeah, hopefully. Uh, and i hope true. that we don't have to wait 15 years i hope that in the next 5 years we'll have facilitation all the job descriptions of managers yeah quite possibly hopefully we need to do. because then there's the entire body of creativity and even i mean there are there are academics who do research on meetings Mm. And I've interviewed uh, Joe Allen. He has been on the podcast and he is, he's an academic, he's a professor and his field of study are meetings. So why not having then the meta level of the meetings, which is facilitation? Yeah. And as part of that creativity, and I think the entire body of how to measure creativity and creative outcomes is definitely under-researched because with Elise Keith, she's working on a project actually to, to quantify, to measure, are we more creative or less creative when we are online versus um, hybrid or offline? Because mm. the, there's been a, a study, um, I think in science. So it was, um, it was covered in science magazine. So a researcher, academic well recognized magazine and they showed that um the online is killing creativity but the way they measured creativity was basically just counting the number of ideas generated mm. and now the question is does this really what are we measuring are we really measuring creativity or something else so then the question is, is this then also related to facilitation? Because what we are actually doing is we're helping groups to become more creative. But then how do we quantify that? And is it always about the group being more creative? So, you know, I know, I you know, I often think, you know, the facilitator is an instrument of management, right? So, so often we're hired to get something done that they can't get done themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's understanding this idea of, you know, it's often how, why consultants are hired. They're going, we want to say something, we want to put a point of view out there, but we need it to be authored by a reputable third party. We know what they're going to say. It's what we want, you know, it's, it, we want this. But if we get them to do it, then we can say, well, okay, it was them that decided who put forward the point of view. You know, and you meet M&A people and they'll say, look, I hire two consulting firms. One says, do it write that report. The other one writes the report that says, don't do it. And then we just decide which one we're going to table to justify the decision that, you know, the six of us have decided to take, for example. And so there, the consultant is an instrument. So when the facilitator is an instrument, you might say, well, they go, look, I don't want creativity. I want you to get them to buy into the strategy. So can you run a workshop? Because I've written a strategy and it's what we're going to do. I just need them to like it and to feel as though that they have had influence into it. So I have this phrase I'll use with clients going, so it sounds like what you're giving them is tethered autonomy, which is they can do whatever they want, provided they land in the three columns that you've already sort of shaped. That's and you know, circulation. That, right. Well, that, you know, what an interesting idea because the owner of that team will say, look, I don't want a free-for-all of ideas. There are three things we do need to hit. I'm happy to let the group come up with what some of the tactical initiatives might be underneath those three broad headings but I don't want any debate about the three broad headings. And so mm, I think facilitators okay. often sit in an interesting place where on the one hand, we don't want creativity. We're trying to get the group to conform. And then on the other hand, we're saying, although give us some ideas about the set of tasks we're going after together at this level, at the tactical level, but don't debate the strategy, for example. And I think that's, we might discuss what we understand by creativity. <laughs> Because for me, creativity means connecting old ideas in a new way, making connections that haven't been there before. Mm -hmm. And if a group is asked to come up with tactics within a certain framework that has been preset, then yes, this requires creativity, meaning that everyone comes in with their own experience and background in order to find the tactics that are necessary to drive the strategy. And then I think there's an important difference between the invitation for the group. So if, if the facilitators brought in, say, 
we have set the strategy already. We have our three buckets, but we want the group to believe that it was their effort so that they buy in. For me, that's not facilitation, that's manipulation, that's facipulation. So for me, this is a huge red flag because you're basically fooling the group. Whereas when you're telling the group, okay, this is the overall strategy. These are the three buckets we have already defined. And now we want you to help us to implement that. Then this is framing. It's um, creating boundaries. Uh, what was that word you used? Facipulation. Was that? Yeah. It's one of the, <laughs> it was one of my podcast guests who, uh, who framed this concept. And I love it. It's using fac- yeah. facilitation to manipulate a group. Well, yeah, it's it, I mean, it's an interesting, interesting premise. And I know we're drifting away from our our episode title, and and maybe it's a it's a it's a definition of terms thing. I suppose, you know, I think we get briefed at times to help buy in, help a group sign up to a set of ideas that a higher authority has determined, and maybe that's it's in the framing of that. If if that language needs to be sharper or or more definitive, but then for them to feel as though, look, it's not a fully baked plan on a page, it's a partially baked one, and we want you to help us finish it. Or, you know, I've done the, to, not to overplay the metaphors, but I've, you know, I've, I've done the sponge cake, but you guys are going to ice it and dress it. You know, and I can understand the practicality of that for an organisational leader going, look, I need... I need to go in this broad direction, but I need them. I need my team to feel part of things, and as you know, they've partially contributed to the shape of the plan. And I suppose, you know, I, I'm, it's funny what I'm finding myself reacting to the word manipulate because I know it's got a negative connotation, but but I think we do manipulate in, in a technical sense, mm-hmm. not in a Machiavellian sense, but I think we do. And maybe again, it's a definitional thing around. You know, we're trying to push a group in a certain direction. And I think, you know, and I wonder whether this is in our field a bit sometimes that we feel like we must just stay open to things, whereas we do need to bring a purpose and a direction and a structure. And, you know, if the if the group is running late, you know, we know there are flights that need to be caught and people are going to leave at 4.30 as we're getting close, we might manipulate the group a bit to, uh, and again, maybe people will just catch on that term and say, well, Marcus, you're not manipulating them. You're just telling them that we're running out of time. We need to speed mm. up. You know, we might pull an exercise out. We might speed up a process. We might not hear from every group. Is that manipulation or is that just facilitation? Maybe I'm overcomplicating it. And it's a, it's a valid point. Maybe manipulation just means making someone do something. And then, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, maybe that's it because I'd, I'd sort of go to that's a, a sort of coercive almost. I guess maybe that's a, a term. I think it has a negative connotation. Mm. The word, yeah, it, yeah, it um, does. How we usually use it, but I think in the essence, it's just making someone do something, which must not be negative. No, but see, how do we account then if we were to go and learn, go back to our how we learn, and we go to learn at our um by watching our military colleagues direct troops, for example. And it may not be that, but that's an example of somebody who is commanding a group to go in a certain direction in a certain way. I would argue, I think at times that can be useful, Mm -hmm. even just the sheer practicalities of marshalling the group, of calling their attention. You know, you're with a group of 40, 60, 80, 120 people, and, you know, you need to get their attention quickly. You need to move them to a new activity or or moment in the agenda or part of the day and you know i would argue we're going to be incredibly directive and forceful but but not coercive or manipulative i suppose Mm -hmm. yeah and now i'm thinking of all the facilitation and workshops that are not the conversational or business workshops as we might have had them in mind throughout our conversation up to now yeah so A few episodes ago, I interviewed Tom Goldhand, who is a facilitator of dance workshops. Lovely. And what I found fascinating is that we're using the same tools. Mm. Well, or the same techniques, I should say, because he's not using sticky notes. Yes. 
And still it's all about the grounding, the check-in, the different guiding a group through different phases. So to what extent would a general education or training and facilitation be applicable to different types of workshops that might not necessarily be the business workshops? Well, I mean, I think I, th you've, I think you've answered your own question, which what, with what you said at the beginning was that he's using the, it's not sticky notes, but that he's using similar techniques around you know the, the initiation of the program and the group engagement and um, I mean what's sparked a thought in my mind is just how lovely the idea of going where the modality is is dance, mm -hmm. um, which is reminding me of those workshops that were very fashionable about. Oh, 15 years ago, the drumming workshops. I don't know whether they took off in other parts of the world where a, a troop would come in with, and everybody would get one of those. Djembe. Sort of, djembe, yeah, hourglass-shaped drums. But they never spoke a single word until the very end. There was not a single word uttered. Um, what they did was command the room with then, you know, the master lead drummer, for want of a term, would then slam their hand on their drum and bring the audience to attention. Then they would demonstrate and then the group would copy and then they'd cut the group up into half or thirds of the room. And it was a beautiful exercise in, you know, look at how we're communicating and yet we're not using, you know, mm -hmm. traditional language and words. And so maybe dance and other things like that, I, I think would be beautiful metaphors for helping group. We used to do an exercise years ago in a mastery facilitation program where it it was entirely nonverbal. You had to get up and communicate to the group your ideas, but you, you could do everything else except speak. So mm -hmm. you could use your hands and your facial expressions and you could gesture and walk across the stage and go up to your, your flip chart or your slide. You just couldn't talk. And then the test was to see when the audience was asked what was you know, what was Miriam trying to convey? And then you'd match that with what you were trying to convey mm -hmm. and whether or not the audience felt it. You know, it's a lovely exercise, which, you know, again, dance could be an element of that. I'd be awful at it, but um, it would certainly be a good stretch. Yeah, and then I think bringing all these other disciplines in would actually enrich the craft so much and help Yeah. Each and every one of us to then go deeper with the group and really help them to leverage their collective intelligence. Yes. Yeah. And, and in quite extreme groups, you know, imagine yes. taking facilitators, budding facilitators to an aged care facility and say, right, run, run the activities morning at the aged care home. And yes. then we're going to go over to the preschool and you're going to run the activities morning there, you know, to learn to work with groups that are, You know, again, I'm conscious there are people as facilitators that go, that's all I do. I work with those groups all the time. And again, I'm inside my corporate organizational bubble, but that they're they're very unusual groups for somebody in that in that sphere. And imagine, you know, that that is a force to to practice, to coordinate. I often look at the the parents that are coaching the young kids' sports teams and have absolute admiration for what they're doing because I'm like, oh, here I am, and I work with groups for a living. And this magnificent parent is, whose kid is in the in the sports team, has taken it on voluntarily to wrangle these six year olds on a football field. And it was, I used to love watching it, just in awe of going, God, your patience, your knowledge of the game again. So they knew the the game, the rules. I didn't know the rules. They knew the rules, and the way they wrangled those. And I thought, what a great exercise, you know. Not fair on the kids, maybe, but what a wonderful facilitation exercise to practice. Absolutely. And I love the example because children also, they're so, so honest. And I yeah. think it reflects to what you said um, before that you've seen fantastic facilitators who've never done any facilitation course or read any facilitation book and still coming from a corporate job or whatever, or parenting, they stand there and do a great job. Yes. And I guess these parents, and actually my brother is one of them, um, teaching kids um, soccer. What they intuitively do is a sort of check in grounding, getting the children to calm down, to leave behind whatever they did before so that they 
can arrive and engage in the sports together as a team. Yeah. And I think there's plenty we could learn from them and from uh, facilitating maybe a group of kids playing soccer yeah. um, that we could apply eventually for our groups that would yeah. then feel like a walk in the park. Well, that's right. It's those, those edge cases, like going to a stand-up comedy open mic night, like working with children, working in, in an aged care home, like really going to those edges of going, you know, can you operate in those environments? You know, I, I think in, in corporate settings, I think it's always interesting, you know, when you work with a client who's in a good context and they're winning and life's good and the money's fine and things are happening the way they want them to happen, and then you get to one where they're not fine and they're losing and it's hard. And it's difficult and the conversations are about cutbacks and, and you know, sacrifice and loss. You know, I think it's interesting to to move across those contexts and, and to work with people who aren't having a great time. You know, some people love being in the workshops that we're running. It's a good day for them. It's, it's, a, it's a thing they look forward to. They're glad it's happening. And then other times they go, I'm not looking. I didn't look forward to today. I'm not happy to be here. I'm not pleased about this topic or this meeting or this proposition that we're working on today. You know, you know that's a very different facilitation context. Yeah. <laughs> I see so many opportunities when it comes to so many different layers to train facilitation in a different way that is neither academic, so the bachelor, nor the way we're doing it now, but just bringing mm. all these different layers and different contexts to learn from. Yeah, with I, I think that that idea of scholar practitioner, I think, is a nice because there are bodies of theory that have been developed, and so we can be a scholar and that be useful, but not just a scholar, with also the practitioner, and then that movement between those two things, I would argue, I would might be the most productive way to advance our field and advance our professionalism, and so we, if we were to spend time in you know peer supervision you know, mm. supervised supervision in, in, in the true sense, you know, where we sat down with a case of a workshop that we'd recently done. You know, Michael Ballant did this with the with the medical doctors and, you know, that model gets copied in other with other clinical fields where they talk to each other about instances of their work and they really pay attention to a specific instance but in order to improve in the general. Um, yeah. You know, and lawyers do that and teachers do that and other doctors do that. So I think that case-based approach is a great way to yeah. the professionals to stay alive and alert to the work that we do. This is so true. And I, I just realized that even in our community is something that we're not doing enough. And I yeah. wonder why, because it's actually, as you say, it's a fantastic opportunity to improve, to learn from real cases. And maybe it's because it's a very vulnerable place to be. Yeah. To bring in these these cases and to think of how can we, what can we do in such either common daily situations or in the extreme situations? Hmm. Let's do that. Yeah. I'd love, look, I'd love to run that with the never done before NBD yeah. community. Um, you know, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a protocol we use with some of our client projects, which is, so it's not just a chat. It's not a free for all. There is a structure. There is a method that sits inside the, the process and then yet it carries out as a conversation but there is a little bit of discipline to it to make sure it doesn't devolve into just a general water cooler yeah. chat but a great way to scholar and so to be scholar practitioner and to also find different perspectives on something that might seem mundane to some of us so for instance recently i spent i think a good hour with uh, two fellow facilitators to discuss the pros and cons of letting participants in an online workshop decide whether they want to join breakout groups or not. Ah, uh, right. Yeah. And we all started with our own opinions, very strong opinions of whether we should or we should not let them choose it for different reasons. And I think at the end of the conversation, we all realized that the topic is more complex than expected. Mm. And yes, there are pros and cons, but now I think for the next time I have just more understanding of 
how to take a decision based on what parameters? Does it- well, that, and, and I think that goes back to the, the conversation before about physics and maths. You know, we don't have rules that are always true. Mm. So, you know, because you're saying, because you think of it as, as an if-then proposition, you know, if the participants want to be able to choose their workshops, then do this. Mm -hmm. Sorry, choose their breakout rooms, then do this. And of course, we don't have that because for for a multitude of reasons, right? And so, but instead, what the case approach goes is someone says, well, I had this situation and I did this and this is what happened. And someone else will say, well, I had this situation and I did this and this is what happened. And neither of those are identical facsimiles of whatever the case owner is dealing with but they might be inspirational to the case owner in the true meaning of that word, inspire a thought going, oh, I like how you phrased what you did. Maybe I can take a teaspoon of your thinking with half a cup of your thinking and a little bit of what I was thinking anyway, and I get myself a, you know, maybe to, I mean, the thought that comes to my mind on that one is, well, maybe you give them a chance to choose rooms in a context where it almost doesn't matter. So you put up a picture of, four things and then you you know i don't know fishing um bushwalking reading dining out with friends four photos and then you label the breakout rooms fishing dining walking whatever and you say choose the room that is the hobby you would do and get into that room and they'll find people who share that hobby and they can talk about why right so it's a lovely innocuous no stakes involved process but they'll suddenly go that was fun choosing my room and yeah going to it you know maybe that's the the reaction they'll have and then next time you put up another one where they get to choose but now it's about a high stakes topic or something that's you know they're more invested in you know and it Mm -hmm. may not work but it might and it might be an avenue yeah yeah and then being in the conversation with some who might have tested it before whether it works and what the pros and cons and the potential outcomes are yeah what remains your number one facilitation challenge Oh well, look at the stage I'm at. My career is 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 staying is is making sure, guarding against complacency, guarding against hubris, guarding against you know professional apathy. You know, it's it's just to remain incredibly curious and completely alert. Part of why I love what you've built and you know this podcast and you know the community you've built is a is a frankly it's a very efficient way to stay abreast of the craft and to plug into what people are doing and thinking and reading and watching and noticing and links and tools and websites and all of that. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a very efficient way to do the thing Mm -hmm. that I'm most nervous about, which is, you know, remaining current and remaining relevant. And, and the challenge is at this stage of the career is, you know, the marginal utility of additional years of practice to make sure they are accretive to the professional's wherewithal before you know like every you know you 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 know you can reach a point where you're going you're not getting any better and in fact maybe you know your better days are behind you that's that's an absolute existential terrifying thought that i have so doing as much as i can um as often as i can to to remain alert to what's going on and to um you know i facilitated a group the other day that are a talent management agency for social media creators on tiktok and instagram you know, so they're effectively a Jerry Maguire for a gamer, for example, who's got a following because of, you know, and I found myself listening to language in that client briefing where I was like, okay, I don't know what that term means. I don't know what that term means. And I'm looking them up and Googling them and making sure that I could turn up to that event with enough contextual intelligence so that I could land my methods and ideas tightly against the context in which they're, they're working. Thank you for sharing that. I love the story and the layers. And one thing that just popped up in my mind was, so the first one was, is it even possible that as a facilitator, we become worse in our craft or that we, because I think it's the longer we are in the game, the more grounded we are, the more presence we have, the more we can really support the group. And then thinking of this lingo, I was wondering if the group wouldn't have been, it sounds like Gen Z youngsters who live in a different world, use different lingo. 
if it had been a group of quantum physicists, would you have felt the same degree of anxiety of not knowing the words? Probably not. <laughs> so I think, what is it? And that's again, that's the inner game, right? To what extent is it just because they're younger, we suddenly feel that, oh, we are not no longer relevant or we cannot discuss with them. Although it's just, again, a different context, a different profession, maybe even. <laughs> Um, I think, I mean, the anxiety I had was that I think in the first exam, in the quantum physics example, I don't think those individuals would have an expectation that their their private jargon is is widely understood by by mm -hmm. others. Whereas I th I think, and again, I might be this might be my own, you know, inadequate and pr projection. I think, you know, this cohort that you're right, they were they were young professionals. Mm -hmm would reasonably have an expectation that this is just a standard understanding of how things are done, how things are thought about, how they're described. And Good it's point. a it's a language and a lingo that, you know, we want to feel heard. You know, in the mm. early days of my career, I was popular by my employer to run grad programs because I wasn't that old and I'm much older than the grads themselves. So there was an easy rapport. Uh, and then I remember doing a grad program, you know, Oh, maybe 10 years later, and I made a reference to when I graduated. And they all went, yeah, all right, old man. We were all seven at that point in our lives. And it was a real moment in time. Of course, that was happening gradually and understandably. But suddenly I went, oh, my goodness, I'm no longer the young, used to be a grad not that long ago kind of facilitator. I'm now, you know, I'm 10 years older than these people, not two years older than them. Yeah. So, and again, that, that was always a little, you know, it, a, yeah. a gentle anxiety. Yeah, you're, and you're right. I think it's um, the expectation of the group to be understood and for us to understand their words. Mm. Good one. Wow. So, Marcus, after a bit more than an hour of conversation, do we need a bachelor of facilitation? Well, I don't know. Were we ever going to get to that answer? I think... I think we'd find a willingness to be more deliberate with the education in our field. Do we need a bachelor's degree? I mean, you know, maybe we don't need one, but maybe we would benefit from a more deliberate structure around the learning that we do in our field. And part of it is trade college and applied, and part of it is theoretical and to understand those theoreticians. I think we've got to learn how to relate to our content. We've got to learn how to get our content to relate to our participant. We've got to learn how to relate to our participant and we've got to learn how to get participants to relate to themselves. So I think there's four things that we need to be able to do. And each of those could be thought about in a teacherly way, which would involve a blend of the theoreticians and the scholars and some practice and then toggling back and forth between those two things. And I think that would be a, a welcome and valuable way for us to think about our craft and the teachings of it. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a privilege and pleasure to come back and spend time with you. It's lovely. Yeah. I found it uh, thought provoking. Yeah, me too. You know, I'm still thinking about um, coercion, manipulation, facilitation, and <laughs> that'll stay with me for a while. And next week when I'm, getting a group to do something without really wanting to give them any options around it. I'll, I'll be asking myself some hard questions. <laughs> Let me know how this goes. I'm yes. looking forward to our case discussions in the community. Yeah, let's set that up. Good idea. Thank you for staying tuned and for listening to the show. I know how busy you are and I appreciate that you're sharing your two most valuable resources with me and my guest, your time and your attention. If you're looking for more conversation with other facilitators and for a community of practice, why don't you join Never Done Before, the community that I have built and many of my podcast guests are already members. Visit neverdonebefore.org and I wish to see you there.